Production. Recorded live. Good evening, everybody. This is another broadcast of Nothing But The Truth. Um, today, I will be hosting this call, Juggler 66, as you know me, uh, because Michael Adams couldn't be here today. He has some very important business to attend to in the hospital, and we all pray for the good uh, working of that visit that he has to do there five times this week and our prayers are with him of course um, I will not start with the um, headlines of yahoo.com because frankly I just didn't read them <laughs> I didn't prepare for that reading but we are going here today to have another very important broadcast and uh, I want to um, uh, introduce two people that are very near to my heart, very close to my heart, um, that will be joining me in this broadcast. And uh, the first of them is uh, Walt Stickle from the website granddesignexposed.com. And uh, he is also one of the reasons that uh, I came up with the idea of making this broadcast. Hello, Walt. How are you? Greetings and good morning from the Oregon coast. You have a sunny day, you told us. Sunny days, sunny skies here. Yeah, we, we, get 60, than, we get yeah. 60 inches of rain, and this is a, one of the days we enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> well, after rain comes sunshine, I would say. Um, well, <clears throat> the reason that, that we are doing this broadcast today, um, this broadcast is called uh, The Characteristics of Antichrist. And uh, I came by that idea to make this broadcast some time ago when I got to know you. And after uh, I got to know you, you introduced me to Tom Press, who did a reading some years ago on Inquisition Update on a book called Romanism and the Reformation. And uh, this book, Romanism and the Reformation, that Tom has read and that you have put up then on another talk show website as broadcasts, um, that... Uh, gave me so much insight into who the Antichrist is, and not only who the Antichrist is, but into the whole history of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and most of all, the reading that Tom did, I was so impressed by the way that he read that, that when I stumbled upon this characteristics of Antichrist, which I will refer to later and explain where that comes from, I thought it would be very nice to have Tom on this program and, and going with us through these different points of the characteristics of Antichrist. So now I want to welcome Tom Fress from Inquisition Updates. Tom, how are you? Yes, fine. Thanks for inviting me and uh, nice to be here and uh, anxious to get started. Yes, I'm glad you're here because if you weren't there, this broadcast wouldn't probably even be on because... Uh, I think it is really important that you are uh, on here because the, the, the insight that you have by having read all these books online and being on ham radio and I don't know what radio shows all, you can introduce that to our listeners in a moment if you want to. Uh, with all that, <clears throat> that uh, knowledge and wisdom you have been given by uh, reading these books and the Bible, um, this broadcast wouldn't have been possible without you, I tell you that. Now, this is not exactly the first time that we go through the characteristics of Antichrist, of course. When you listen to other shows, you know that we have done that already. But there were a few reasons that convinced me that we had to do the first broadcast of this uh, series all over again. There were a few things that bothered me that happened in the first broadcast at that time. And today we have eliminated these things that uh, made it run bad at that time. And now we are doing it over again and probably even with a better insight than we did at that time, because now we finished already the all 26 characteristics of Antichrist. These characteristics of Antichrist can be found on a website that is called uh, www.remnantofgod.org by uh, a brother called Nicholas. And as Tom will probably sustain me in that opinion, and Walt also, this is one of the most, if not the most, comprehensive site knowledge when you look for the history of the Roman Catholic Church, when you look at identifying the Antichrist, and when you want to have real fellowship with some people. Uh, so everything about Christianity, the New World Order, um, SDA apostasy, the Antichrist, not only the characteristics thereof, but everything uh, 
you know, the gods of the beast, uh, uh, what about holy days or holidays, persecution, uh, GMO data, uh, the RCC exposed, the Roman Catholic Church exposed on many pages on this website, paganism in the church, uh, the horrific, of course, uh, deals with the uh, uh, with the fourth O uh, with the fourth O of induction from the Jesuits. And there's a lot of news on there. There's a lot of Bible truths on there concerning the Sabbath, the commandments, and all this stuff. So I can really advise you to go to their website www.remnantofgod.org, and there you will also find this page: characteristics of Antichrist. Uh, Nicholas had made this work not only to make this one page, but also put it into a PDF file, and that PDF book is 123 pages long, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 123 pages. So that's a lot of stuff that we have to deal with. But today we will only uh, deal with the first five um, characteristics of Antichrist, if we get that far. We have to cover five again to recover the first show. And we will see how long it will take us today and whether we have to split this in one or two broadcasts. I think that is something we will see when we go along. Anyway, Tom, um, as I said, this broadcast wouldn't have been possible without you. And I thank you very much for being here and uh, sharing your knowledge and your insight um, with us here today on the characteristics of Antichrist. And I just want to start with a little question to you, Tom. Uh, do you think it is important for the people who are living in this age today to know who Antichrist is, or are we just making a, a, a new point here with this broadcast? Well, in my opinion, my studied opinion, my decades-long study, studied opinion is it's essential that we know who the Antichrist is. The Antichrist is the papacy, the entire history of the papacy. And without that knowledge, we will be deceived. We will be deceived into believing that the Antichrist, as is taught in the churches today, is one single individual that comes at the end of time. But the Bible clearly states that the Antichrist is guilty of the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. To say that the Antichrist comes at the end of time denies that that Antichrist is, the, is guilty of the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. The saints and the martyrs of Jesus have arisen all throughout the Christian era. There's no other institution on the face of the earth, not even a candidate for the role of Antichrist in the world, but the papacy. And this is exactly what the Protestant Reformation was built on. It was built upon the, the knowledge, the biblical, historical, and prophetic knowledge that the papacy and only the papacy could qualify as the little horn of Daniel, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. No other candidate in world history but the papacy. And the, the first pope and all of his successors until the return of Christ. And uh, as we continue with this reading and study, uh, I'm sure the listeners will concur uh, that Rome fits the bill. The Vatican, the papacy fits the bill. And uh, what one has to ask oneself, was there a purpose, a strategic purpose, in teaching about a single individual, a future Antichrist? Indeed there was. And that is to shed the onus of Antichrist away from the papacy. That it has done. And because of that, the Vatican laid the foundation for what we see today in the Christian world, ecumenism the unification of all the churches of the world, all the religions of the world, into one global religion. But more specifically for our cause is the unification of all churches that call themselves Christian back under 
the Roman Catholic Church. And even more specific than that, all of the Protestant churches back under the authority of the church that they originally protested, the Church of Antichrist, the Synagogue of Satan, the Roman Catholic Church. So it's essential to know who the Antichrist is. Those before us knew. That's why they protested. They protested Antichrist. They came out of that church in 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 uh, uh, compliance with the with the command of Christ in Revelation chapter eighteen. Come out of her, my people, that you partake not of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath not forgiven but hath remembered her iniquities. And that's what liberated all of Europe back in the days when the papacy controlled all the kings of the earth. And one was not permitted to read the Bible, God's holy word. One was not permitted to speak a word against the Antichrist, the pa- or one would be burned at the stake or stretched on the rack or crucified and uh, are otherwise tortured and all of his goods confiscated. They were not allowed to buy or to sell. No one was to give them succor or support or help. And uh, that is the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. And they were claimed by the papacy, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. If you believe in a future Antichrist, you have been deceived. That's how essential it is to know who the Antichrist is. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom, for that elaboration. Well, is there something that uh, you want to say about the importance of this broadcast that we are doing here? No, no right now you... Uh, uh, it's, uh, But I do think it's... it's the, I'll say this about this question on the Antichrist. When you understand the Antichrist, you understand what's going on in the world. You can never put the pieces together if you're always looking for the global elites or the financial or the Jews. But when you understand this organization that has been around for over 15 years, 1,500 years ago, just, you know, now the news reads, now you get... When you listen to the news, you get the rest of the story. That's right. I I also want to add something to that. Um, A lot of people will probably think when they listen to this broadcast, we are just here to bashing the Roman Catholic Church. We are just here to bash so-called Christians. My view on that subject is... That and we have had broadcasts on that, and you both were on that, so you can always um, fall into my argument here. We did this broadcast on the externalization of the hierarchy, where we showed that Freemasonry, what Tom so righteously called just the Protestant arm of the Jesuits, worked through the in the 1920s founded Lucifer's Trust that was then later changed to the name of Lucifer's Trust by Ellis Bailey, which is still today a publishing company for the United Nations papers, how they put up 10 so-called commandments on how to get the world away from God. It started, for example, with the 1963, when in America, the morning prayer was taken out of the school system. And we covered a few broadcasts on the externalization of the hierarchy, two and a half broadcasts and all together. So if you haven't listened to that, listen to that. But my point being is that this system that we are living in is trying everything to take God out of the equation, out of our daily life, out of our education, out of our family life, out of our life with our friends, and they go even so far to take God out of the church. Because the God that is taught today in the Roman Catholic Church and also in the Protestant churches is not the God of the Bible anymore. They do not refer to the King James Bible of 1611 
as the only one true preserved word of God in the English language. You can read the NIV, the NSV, and the New Living Translation, and I don't know whatever other Bibles you want to. But all these Bibles will never make the same sense as the King James Bible does. And the whole system that has been set up with the help of the Jesuits and with the help of Freemasonry, to name just these both arms, works so very well that when today, when you are not born into a deep Bible-believing family, Christian family, that God will probably play no part or a very, very little part in your life. The problem is that when you do not know God and when you do not know Jesus Christ, your Savior, who has died for all of us 2,000 years ago on the cross by shedding his blood and taking all our sins on him, when you do not know Jesus Christ, you do not know who your friend is. And when you do not know who your friend is and you look around and you look at everybody else to be your friend, and the Roman Catholic Church plays a role that can very easily deceive you in being your friend. And only when you try to study real history that has, taken out, that has been taken out of the school system, out of history classes, out of the colleges and universities, and also out of the seminaries where priests attend. When you only follow these studies, you will have no chance of discovering who your friend is, Jesus Christ. And by that, you will probably embrace your enemy as your friend. With all this wonderful humanism teaching and this... Uh, environmental teaching they do, and all these points. When you do not see through that deception, you will, leave, uh, you will live a deceived life. And when you live a deceived life, you will not find the way to Jesus. And when you do not find the way to Jesus, then all you will ever have is this life. And you will probably spend the rest of eternity not with Jesus Christ. So, this broadcast, among others, of course, is also to waken people up and to say, not everything that you can only smell, feel, touch, see, is what is really around you. There's a spiritual life that is much more important than this material life that we are seeing and feeling and touching and smelling every day. And you have to open up yourself to the spiritual life, to understand the Word of God, and actually to understand the reason of your being here. We as Bible-believing Christians, we believe that the world is now about 6,000 6, years old, and that God in the beginning made the world and everything that is in it. Jesus Christ made the world and everything that is in it. And you have a life here, maybe 20, maybe 50, maybe 70, maybe 90, maybe even 100 years or a little bit more. And if you think that that is really all, you, with your mind, with your character, that God formed when you were in the womb, when you think that that is all it takes to be here in this world, because you probably believe in evolutionism, and that's not your fault because you have been taught this all your life, then you are an heir. And we want to use this broadcast not only to bring God more into your life, or even into your life, if, it hasn't, if he hasn't been there, but we want to tell you about who your enemy is, that you can embrace your real friend, your real Savior, the man Jesus Christ, who died for your sins on the cross 2,000 years ago. Tom, is there something you want to add to that? Hard to add to perfection, Jörg. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, then I will go start and uh, read this um, page, The Characteristics of Antichrist. Uh, you have to understand every time <clears throat> when I read that, of course, and I read I, then this is from the person of Nicholas who made this site. Uh, I'm going to read an, a little introduction on that, and uh, Tom or Walt, whenever you guys feel to say something and to add something to that that I've just read, 
please come in and interrupt me, and otherwise I will go to, to the next point. So we will see where that takes us. Okay, I'm going to quote from the site now. We now have the benefit of historic records at our fingertips today. History is behind us. We have proof the prophecies were fulfilled in the exact years as well as the exact manner the Bible said it will be. As Christians, we now need to take the advantage of these historic records. We need to use the history books to prove these facts so as to share with those that do not believe. It will bless them. It will open their eyes. It will fill God's church. It will make heaven that much better to have them there when heaven starts. Before investigating the prophetic symbols that describe the characteristics of Antichrist, we need to understand that the Word of God tells us how to define symbols and prophecy. 2 Peter 1 verse 20 says that, quote, No prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, end quote. According to the word, Christians are told not to give our own opinions of what a prophet symbol, uh, prophetic symbol means. We must allow the word of God to define its own symbols. Our private interpretations are useless. For example, the term many waters in prophecy doesn't mean a large lake or ocean, and the word woman does not mean an actual woman. There are symbolic images hidden in plain sight as to prevent the wicked from knowing the truth about the times we live in. If they knew it, they would be more effective in their attack against God's remnant people and have much more effective in twisting God's word. Truth is, there are 404 verses in the book of Revelation, and out of those 404 verses, 278 of them carry the bulk of the prophetic message of that book. Did you know that all 278 of those verses can be found almost word for word in all the other books of the Bible? In other words, the Bible defines itself perfectly. Each symbol in Daniel, Revelation, or any other prophetic book are defined in detail in God's Word. So don't let anyone give you their opinion or interpretation when preaching such things. We must always let the Word define the Word. That's an easy way to expose false teachers. Just hear what they have to say. Then open the Bible and see if what they say matches up with what the Lord says regarding a certain symbol. So, what does the Word of God have to say about all those symbols that define certain desires, characteristics, and plans of the Antichrist? And does history confirm the prophecy authentic? Now, there follows a listing of 26 characteristics that will all be discussed in this and the other broadcast that we do on characteristics of Antichrist. And the first one is that Antichrist has to destroy three nations after Rome falls. The second one says Antichrist receives its seat and authority from Rome. The third one says Antichrist is both political and religious power. And the fourth one continues that Antichrist will have his church and state sit on seven hills. Antichrist is to rule the world for 1260 years, says characteristic number five, and in characteristic number six, we are told that Antichrist is wounded after this 1260 year reign. Characteristic number seven identifies the Antichrist because he receives a deadly wound with later heals, and in characteristic number eight, we go into Antichrist is the beast that was, is not, but yet is. Antichrist is to be a blasphemous power, tells us characteristic number nine, and he also will be able to charm the world to worship him. That's characteristic number ten. In number eleven, we will see that the Antichrist will understand the dark sentences of hell, and also that he declares Jesus has not come in the flesh in characteristic number twelve. In number thirteen, it is told us that Antichrist is to use craftiness and deceit in a major way and that Antichrist is to preach another Jesus unto all. Tammuz, just one of the key words I want to add here, and that was characteristic number 14. Characteristic number 15 is probably known by everybody because Antichrist controls a man whose name will echo 666, and how that is explicitly written in the Bible and explained to you in the Bible, 
We will go to that in the 15th characteristics of Antichrist. The Bible is the Word of God and the preserved Word of God, and that is exactly why the Antichrist hates the Bible and anyone that uses it. That will be characteristic number 16. In number 17, we read that Antichrist has a church that makes war with the saints. And Antichrist is a world power which the world then, of course, wanders after. That's characteristic number 18. In number 19, we will see that the Antichrist is a so-called Christian church mixed with Babylon. Refer to Revelation number 18, for example. In number 20, we will learn that Antichrist must join with the kings of the earth. And in number 21, we will see that Antichrist will also uh, will mock Christ so as to confuse all the people who are unlearned. And that means the people who, don't study, uh, who do not study the Bible. And by that, again, I lay emphasis on the King James Bible. In characteristic number 22, we will learn that Antichrist men will be sodomites. They will be homosexuals. And in number 23, the Antichrist forces Christians to hiding for 1260 years. There we go again, back to the point that we made a little bit earlier, this 1260 years prediction. Characteristic number 24 will be that characteristic is a mother church that spawns many errors, and there have been a lot of articles about that lately with our latest Pope, Pope Francis, where he said, as I remember well, uh, Christians are not made in a factory, and there is no salvation outside of the church, outside of the mother church. In characteristic 25, we see that Antichrist seeks to tamper with time, uh, to tamper with and change times and laws. He seeks to tamper with time, to change times and laws. He cannot actually change times and laws, but he can teach you that actually he did. And how he does that? That will be the one but last characteristic. And in the end, we have characteristic number 26, and this is also a very important one. The Antichrist will use drugs on the masses to control them. Some would you like to add something here before I now go over reading the first characteristic of Antichrist to do a little bit deeper explanation of maybe one of the points or any other thoughts that you might have gathered in the, in the meantime? Yes, I do have a comment that's appropriate at this time, and that is if one takes all 26 of these characteristics and finds their fulfillment in only one entity in world history, then you know that you found the Antichrist. No matter what anybody else says, whether he be a preacher or a priest or a pastor or a friend or a government or a school or any other thing, you know you have found Antichrist. Do you understand that if all 26 of these characteristics are found only in the papacy, that the likelihood, or rather the statistical probability of all these 26 elements being found in the papacy and nowhere else defies the laws of probability. All 26 of these to be found in the papacy virtually leaves one a certainty that the papacy and only the papacy can be the Antichrist. Now, for instance, take all the prophecies in the Bible regarding Jesus. They include the very words that he would use on the cross, that he would be born of a virgin, of the house of David, on and on and on. All of those prophecies about Jesus Christ. If you take every one of those innumerable, innumerable prophecies regarding Jesus Christ, and if you find them in one man, you have a virtual certainty. Now, no one, is, no one uh, here, at least, is in doubt about who the Christ is. Likewise, there is no one here who is in doubt about who the Antichrist is. Because just like all those prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus Christ, these prophecies about Antichrist are only fulfilled in the papacy, all 26 of them. They defy the statistical probability that exists in the entire universe. So, 
another point that I would like to make at this time is, is to define what prophecy is. Common sense dictates that prophecy is simply history told in advance. God is omnipotent, omniscient, and he, he can see the ending from the very beginning. And since God has that power to see the ending from the very beginning and everything that happens in between, that's what makes him uh, the prophet. That's why all of his prophets could see things in the future, because they were given God's perception. And they were given to prophesy these things. And those prophecies were fulfilled in history. So if prophecy, as common sense dictates, is simply history written in advance, then to observe that a prophecy is fulfilled or not is perceived by history. In other words, if you study history and you find the fulfillment of a Bible prophecy in history, then you can mark it down as fulfilled. Likewise, if you look through history and you cannot find the fulfillment of a Bible prophecy, then it is yet to be fulfilled. The point I'm trying to make is how important it is to be familiar with history. If you're not familiar with history, you cannot see whether or not prophecy has been fulfilled. What has been fulfilled in the past or what is yet to be fulfilled in the future? And without knowing these things, we're blind. And also, without knowing these things, we can be deceived. There's also a consideration that needs to be factored in here. What prophecies have literally been fulfilled, as written in the Scriptures? And what prophecies is Satan trying to re-fulfill in the future? I'm speaking about Daniel's 70th week, and there's plenty of time to talk about that. We'll talk about it further down in uh, in the broadcast. But this uh, expose of the characteristics of Antichrist is going to speak about history, showing us that the prophecies of the Bible were fulfilled in history. And this history has been erased from the, from the textbooks and the history books of the schools and the seminaries and the churches. And this is why God's people are ignorant. But Protestants have preserved this history. And it's by the hand of Protestant historians that we are now, it is revealed to us, who fulfilled these prophecies regarding Antichrist. And, and there's a specific reason why the, this history has been erased from the history books. It, it discloses who the Antichrist is. And because the government, the education systems of the world have cooperated with the Antichrist and removed this history, this is why the people are ignorant today of who the Antichrist is. When this history is restored in their minds, then they can be just as confident as we are who the Antichrist is. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. And even on the danger of going to repeat myself, I still want to lay the emphasis once again on reading the right Bible. If you have any doubt that your Bible is the right Bible, then I want to turn your attention to a video that Walter Feit made some years ago that was called Battle of the Bibles and to other videos that followed that called Changing the Word. And in that, he will explicitly explain to you in how many verses and places the original version of the King James Bible has been changed. And what Tom just said, that prophecy is just history told in advance, is right. And you can understand that when you read the true word of God, when you read the other Bible versions, I can assure you, but you can do the research on your own. 
don't believe me, don't believe Tom, don't believe Walt, don't believe anything or anyone on this call until you can confirm what we say by your own research. Go and look it up. There's a website called BibleHub.com. And there you can see the comparison of every Bible verse that you want. And you can, can compare what is written in the original King James Version to all the other new Bibles. And you will see that some verses are even taken out or have been changed to the agenda, to follow the agenda of the Roman Catholic Church that denies the deity of Jesus Christ. Because, of course, the Roman Catholic Church teaches the Pope is Jesus Christ, hidden under a veil of flesh. And you will never understand this deception when you read their Bibles. As also, you will never understand true history when you read their history books. Everything that is taught to you in the public education system, from kindergarten to university, has been set up by the so-called Society of Jesus. The last 500 years, they have done nothing else than to take over the whole education, and you are only taught canon law. You are not taught Darth law. So even on the danger to repeating myself into oblivion, I have no problem with that. The King James is the only English spoken authority word of God in my mind. Comment? Please. Uh, I'd like to just want one quick comment. <clears throat> also, uh, this is a real easy to check. If you had an N you read the NIV, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, versus the King James, the NIV teaches futurism. That's it. It, it backs up their false, their false uh, the uh, 69th week with a future Antichrist. And it's real easy to see. All you have to do is read the NIV and then read the King James, and it's just as plain as day what's going on. Would you care to do read it? Say again? Would you care to do read it right now? Uh, do you have it in front of you? N no, I don't have an NIV in front of me. But the, the, see, when it, when it talks about the man of sin and the son of perdition, when you read that chapter in the NIV, it puts it in the future tense. It's just as plain as day what's, what's happening between the NIV and the King James Bible. Yes, it's because all these modern Bibles, all these Jesuit forged Bibles, have to serve the futurist agenda that was brought into living with the 1590 founding of uh, Ribera and Alcazar's futurist agenda to take the heat of the Roman Catholic Church uh, and to start the Counter-Reformation that was started with the Council of Trent in 1545 uh, to 1563. Of course, because kings and princes and counts and uh, all these noblemen of Europe fell away from the Roman Catholic Church at the start of the Reformation in the 1520s, at the time the Protestants were formed. And then, of course, came the Counter-Reformation, and that is something that is not taught today in seminaries that priests or pastors attend, pastors for. The Protestant churches, priests for the Roman Catholic Church, they are not taught anything about Counter-Reformation. They are only taught about, uh, about the Reformation. If, if they are taught that at least. But you will never understand that when you don't read the true word of God, and that is the KGB. Okay, so then I'm going to leave it here, and I will start quoting the first characteristic of Antichrist. That is, Antichrist will destroy three com complete nations out of the original ten of fallen Rome. And we start with uh, a quote from Daniel, Chapter 7, verse 24, quote, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first, 
and he shall subdue three kings, end quote. Daniel identifies immediately that the horns in this vision actually refer to kings. For further confirmation, later in Daniel chapter 8, verse 20, we see the two horns of the ram Daniel sees in vision are, in fact, the two kings of Media and Persia. When pagan Rome fell in 476 AD, it resulted in the formation of ten separate kingdoms. Three of these ten kingdoms rejected the idea of a universal Catholic faith that was both religious as well as political, so as to, be, uh, so as to better control the people of the fallen nation of Rome. They were annihilated for protesting against such an evil entity. First, the Yeruli nation was annihilated in 493 AD. Second, the Vandals in 534 AD. And finally, the Ostrogoths in 538 AD were the final of the three kings that would be subdued, just as Daniel prophesied. With the fall of the Ostrogoths in the year 538 AD, the political entity we today refer to as the Roman Catholic institution began its official reign as the last part of this fourth beast mentioned in the prophecy of Daniel. Now, the ten horns that came to be after Rome fell are these. First, the Alemannus, which is now called Germany. And interesting is, they were called the Alemannis, and when you know that Germany in French is called Allemagne, you see the resemblance of that. Second, the Visigoths, which is now called Spain. The third kingdom were the, Fran the Franks, which is now called France. The fourth were the Swaves, which is now called Portugal. The Burgundians which is now called Switzerland, where the fifth kingdom and the sixth kingdom were the Anglo-Saxons. That's now called England. The seventh kingdom were the Lombards, which is now called Italy. The eighth were the Ostrogoths, nine the Vendel, and ten the Hierulis. Historic records reveal, quote, the three divisions which were plucked up were the Hieruli in 493, the Vandals in 534, and the Ostrogoths in 538. Justinian, the emperor, who we see was at Constantinople, working through the general Belisarius, was the power that overthrew the three kingdoms represented by the three horns. And the reason for their overthrow was their adherence to Arianism in opposition to the Orthodox Catholic faith. This is taken from the book of Daniel, page 109. Another quote follows from History of the Christian Church, Volume 3, page 327. Quote, Vigilius ascended to the papal chair in 538 AD under the military protection of Palisarius. End quote. Catholic emperors of the Western Empire found ways to help the Pope by eliminating three of the Aryan tribes. These Aryan-type nations would not agree with the Pope's plans, by the way. The Catholic Emperor Zeno, between 474 and 491 AD, arranged a treaty with the Ostrogoths in 487, which resulted in the eradication of the kingdom of the Aryan heralds in 492. And the Catholic Emperor Justinian, from 527 to 565, exterminated the Aryan Vandals in 434, 534 and significantly broke the power of the Aryan Ostrogoths in 538. Thus were Daniel's three horns, the heralds, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths, plucked up by the roots. And this quote comes from C. Mervyn Maxwell, God Cares, Volume 1, page 129. The Lord shows Daniel many years prior that after the fall of the pagan kingdom of Rome, <clears throat> or the fourth global kingdom, would arise another power that would seek to regain this global kingdom for its own evil purposes. Daniel saw that when pagan Rome fell, it would split into ten separate kingdoms. He even saw that three of the nations that were part of that split wouldn't go along with new plans to regain this global kingdom. What type of kingdom was this 
that was so evil that three nations were willing to die to prevent its rise. We will discuss this in detail later. And just as Daniel was shown by the Lord, it all happened with perfect timing. History records perfectly every step of Rome in this regard. This is what's so amazing about studying prophecy in the last days. We have history to look back on. We can actually match historic events with prophetic utterances in the word of the Christian God. This completes the reading of the first characteristic of Antichrist, and I just want to take the chance to add a little bit into this here. We see that when pagan Rome fell, it was split up into ten nations that I've just read to you, from the Alemannes to the Hilluris. Now, very interesting to understand that we are living in a deception today is, for example, that the Club of Rome divided the earth into ten different regions, which they call kingdoms. And you can Google that and look that up, because that report is, if I'm not mistaken, of 1976, but no earlier than 1973, so excuse me for when I mix up the dates, 1973 or 1976. The Club of Rome made this known to everybody, and you can Google that and find it and do your own research on that. But I would very much like to hear Tom's explanation, who, go a little, who goes a little bit deeper into the plucking out of the three nations. Tom, please. Yes, here we have a historical account of the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy regarding these three horns that were plucked up by the roots. The heralds, the vandals, and the ostrogoths. The extinction of th these three kings and these three kingdoms took place during the period of time after the Roman Empire fell and during the transition from the old Roman Empire to what is known and what has been known since that time as the Holy Roman Empire, which is not holy at all. It's the very seat of Antichrist. The Caesars were replaced by the popes. And this is, this is what has been erased from history. And significantly, historians know that there's very little historical record of these three kings and these three kingdoms that can even verify that they ever existed. Now, Rome... The, the, the uprooting of the, these three nations puts the onus of Antichrist upon the papacy. It puts the onus of Antichrist upon Rome, the Roman Empire, the fourth and final beast upon the earth. But Rome wants to shed that, that incriminating <clears throat> perception from the scriptures onto someone else. And what I find very, very interesting, you mentioned the Club of Rome. It was the Club of Rome's duty to divide up the world into ten regions, ten kingdoms, a parallel to what existed at the fall of the, the old Roman Empire. When the old Roman Empire broke up, it broke up into ten individual regions. Three of those regions, three of those kingdoms were the Herulis, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. They were exterminated. All of their historical records were, dis were, were destroyed. And it is clear that Rome made the attempt to eventually deny their ever existing. Why? Because Satan, who guides the Roman Catholic Church, has to produce a future fulfillment of this historical account. By Daniel. And so the Club of Rome has broken the world and divided the world up into ten regions. They're called the ten regions of the Club of Rome. Now, if my estimation is correct, in order to counterfeit this original fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, the true fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, three of the, the nation three of the nations of this of this new ten 
this, this new conglomerate of 10 global regions is going to take place. History has yet to prove that this is true, but we do know that Rome denies the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel in the ministry of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago and put and, and has detached that 70th week of Daniel and has put it clear at the end of time. They call it the 70th week of Daniel. They call it the seven years of great tribulation where the Antichrist is going to come, denying that the papacy was the Antichrist all along. And uh, so they're going to shed the onus of Antichrist onto an individual, a single individual at the end of time. And part of the fulfillment, and for this, this phony counterfeit futurist fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, three of these nations have to be destroyed, rooted up. Is this uh, beginning to pique some interest? See how critical it is for us to understand true history? Because if we don't understand true history, we cannot see that Bible prophecy, the prophecies of Daniel, have been fulfilled in history. And if they're fulfilled once, shall they be fulfilled again? Does God have a dual mind? Is he confused? Is he trying to confuse us? It's very important to know when Bible prophecy has been fulfilled. Thereby, we are not deceived about a phony future fulfillment of these prophecies. Now, if after the Club of Rome, which is a think tank dedicated to serving the papacy, that's why they call it the Club of Rome, if after dividing the world into ten regions, three of those kings and kingdoms are destroyed, then the Vatican has every reason to teach and to prove that this prophecy about the Antichrist destroying, destroying three nations has now just occurred. Okay? And this denies that the papacy the Antichrist of the Bible, the Antichrist of history, the Antichrist of prophecy, destroyed these three uh, Aryan nations back at the transition time between the old Roman Empire and the new Roman Empire, the, the holy Roman Empire, they call it. So let our eyes be open to true history. Then, and only then, can we understand that the Bible has perfectly been, the prophecy of Daniel has perfectly been fulfilled. There, thereby, we will not be deceived by a phony futurist fulfillment of it. The whole object of this is to deny that Jesus, that the Messiah has come in the flesh during the 70th week of Daniel. If you believe that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future, you literally deny that Jesus was the Messiah. Daniel prophesied that there would be seven weeks and 62 weeks, and then Messiah would come. And for one week, the 70th week, his ministry would take place. In the midst of the week, he would cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his own life. Three and a half years later, at the stoning of Stephen, the gospel would go to the Gentile world. If you believe in a future 70th week of Daniel, you have literally denied that the Messiah has come. What is the purpose that Rome has in store for us in this deception? To, to introduce to us a false Messiah, a false antichrist and a false messiah the false antichrist will be whoever signs a seven-year peace treaty with the jews allowing them to begin animal sacrifices again the false christ the false messiah will be the one who steps in immediately afterwards and i'm here to tell you in front of the whole world it's going to be the papacy the all-time antichrist Back to you, Yerk. 
Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this explanation. And I want to add two things. First of all, uh, to your wonderful explanation in short now, this time on Daniel's 70th week. Uh, some weeks ago, we made a broadcast on that. Uh, mainly, you did a broadcast on that by reading Daniel verse, chapter 9, verse 23 to verse 27. And last week, I put up a video on that lecture that you did. Uh, that is called uh, Nothing But the Truth, The Greatest Deception Since the Garden of Eden. So anybody who is listening to this broadcast, just go to my YouTube channel, Jodler66, and uh, watch for that video, The Greatest Deception Since the Garden of Eden. Uh, we did also the second part of that, but that I haven't put in the video yet. I will do one of these days. And when you watch that video, and when you listen to Tom carefully, there is, after that reading, when you are spiritually honest, no doubt in your mind that Daniel 70th week has been fulfilled by our Savior, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, and the agenda that Rome plays today, they actually put us back in the 69-week prophecy, awaiting for that 70th week. And what came really clear out of that understanding is, for example, and I'm just taking a little bit from that second broadcast that you did, Tom, by fomenting World War I and World War II and establishing the Jewish state of Israel in 1948, they have to do that because what sense would it make to build a temple in Jerusalem get Jews to make sacrifices if there are no Jews living in the land of Palestine, the Israel of old. That's why they had to get the Jews in there. And the problem is, Jews are not stupid. And they knew that them being transported in any way to Palestine at that time was not biblical. And all the Jews that rejected had to be dealt with. And that's how they did that. That is a whole other broadcast. But you know history, I guess, in that. And there's a second point that I wanted to make because Tom very explicitly said they wiped out these three kingdoms wiped them totally from history records. As it was stated when I read it, they were, quote, unquote, plucked up by the roots. There is nothing left of them. So when you do not study any history books written before that time, you don't even know that these kingdoms existed. That means plucked up by the roots to eliminate every trace to them so that the teaching of today cannot be identified as the lie that it is. And the third point that I wanted to make, as Tom called it, what we have today is the Holy Roman Empire, or what they had in that time, in that time was the Holy Roman Empire. Some time ago I made with Walt on another talk show a radio broadcast that we called the Jesuits derooting the Reformation. And as you probably all know, one of the real roots of the Reformation was next to England was Germany and Luther. And because the Reformation spread from Germany, the goal of the Jesuits always has been to destroy the German nation, what we call here in the Ten Kingdoms the Alamanas. And they did so by finding in the 800s the first Holy Roman Empire of German nation. Everybody knows when you're talking about the Third Reich what that was. But did you ever bother to do research well, when there was a Third Reich, what is the first? Or even the Second Reich? And in this broadcast that Walt and I did on talk show on another site, Jesuits derouting the Reformation, we go and I think five or six broadcasts very deep into the study of what Germany actually was. 
and that it used to be called the Holy Roman Empire of German nation between 800 and 1806, the end of the Napoleonic Wars, a thousand year right. Exactly that what Hitler wanted with his third right, a thousand year right. Tom, Walt, anybody of you has anything to add to this? No, I think you've done quite well. It's interesting that you've mentioned and noted that there were many Jews who refused to go to Israel, even after that land had been established in 1948. They refused to make what we've, known to, what we've come to know today as Aliyah to Israel because they remember their history. They remember how they were in persecution and bondage under Pharaoh in Egypt. And that bondage was not broken until God brought judgment to, his, to, to, to Egypt. The plagues, each one of those plagues were designed against every god that was worshipped, every false god that was worshipped in Egypt. And then finally, when Pharaoh had no choice but to let God's people go, God opened the waters, parted the waters, so that the people could pass over on dry land. The Jews of our day, of uh, prior to the establishment of the modern nation state of Israel, would not go to Israel unless God led them the same way that he led them out of Egypt. And those people had to be dealt with if Rome was going to reestablish Israel, allow a, a temple to be built, and animal sacrifices to once again uh, be, be practiced, the animal sacrificial system by the Jews. He had to, once creating that nation state of Israel, had to have Jews living in the land. So he had to push the Jews out of Europe into Israel. And they did that through the, through the anti-Semitic persecutions of World War I and World War II. That's what it took to get the Jews to go back to their old ancient homeland. The persecutions of World War I and World War II. <clears throat> Why were those persecutions necessary? Because the common belief among the Jewish people was, we have no homeland. God, God cast us out of our land because of disobedience. And if God is going to call us back to our land, he will do it the same way he brought us out of Egypt, out of Egyptian bondage and slavery. And to go back to this nation state, this newly founded nation state of Israel, without God's leading hand, we will be submitting to our own doom. They perceived that the, nation, the modern nation state of Israel as created by, uh, by the papacy and the nations of the world in conjoint effort with her was simply the answer to the final Jewish question how to completely eradicate the Jews from off the face of the earth. They viewed this new nation state as a, a final ghetto for the world's Jews in preparation for the final Jewish pogrom. And they were influential among their Jewish brethren in Europe and in Russia and in the Eastern Bloc nations. And so they had to be eradicated. All voices of dissent about moving back to, the, to their ancient homeland, all dissenting voices had to be silenced because Rome has to do, has to fulfill her counterfeit future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week so that she can, pro, so that she can introduce to the world an antichrist who signs a seven-year peace treaty with these Jews and in the midst of the week causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease and all of that so they can produce, to introduce to the world a counterfeit Christ. And so 
history records exactly how the papacy is trying to fulfill a future counterfeit fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. A prophecy, a seven-year period of time that was perfectly and completely fulfilled by Jesus Christ, the Messiah, 2,000 years ago. And what they are literally doing is deceiving the whole world. And they are preparing them to identify a false antichrist and then accept the papacy as the Christ. All throughout the Roman Catholic Church history, the Roman Catholic Church has taught that the papacy is the vicar or the replacement of Christ on earth. He is Christ, hidden under a veil of flesh. And by that, they are deceiving the whole world. And if they can, within reason, refulfill the 70th week of Daniel, then they will propose to the world a false Christ, a false Messiah, and the whole world will accept it. That's Rome's agenda. That's been Rome's agenda for 2,000 years, and how can I say with any assurance that it has been Rome's agenda for 2,000 years? Because they completely wiped out these three nations. The Heruli, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, plucked them up by the roots. There's nothing left of them. You can't even dig in the dirt to find any remnant of these three kings. Why? because they have to use this to help fulfill their phony futurist fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel by uprooting three kings and three kingdoms. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult for them to credibly fulfill this counterfeit fulfillment. And so the Bible is very specific, and you brought it out. He plucked them up by the roots. There is nothing left of them, including their history. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. And uh, on the subject of um, the Jews that were waiting, or still are waiting for God to lead them into their into a new state, if that would ever happen like that, there's uh, something that I want to bring to your attention, and we're going to cover that in another broadcast. I'm very sure about that. There are videos found on YouTube where uh, there is a man who found original newspapers from the years between 1918 and 1938 where they are speaking of six million Jews in peril in Eastern Europe. Why would they put this in newspapers like the New York Times, and the Washington Post and others. And you can see the original newspapers on film, on YouTube, where they stayed with these articles. That was fear-mongering as we know it today also. And it is said in the Bible, there will be wars and rumors of wars. And they speak of a Holocaust of 6 million Jews in 1918. Do you think that it's a coincidence that Germany was blamed with the killing of 6 million Jews in 1945 when Germany was not existent anymore? But I'll leave this here and I will leave that up to another broadcast and in that broadcast we will also play the video when I make a video of that and then you can see for yourself or you can Google it or just put it in search engine in YouTube. And these videos are still up there. Very interesting to see and to understand the real history. Yerk, I have another comment that I have to make before we continue, and that is many, many people who are listening to me and what I've just said has to be stretching credibility. There's no way the papacy could have seen 2,000 years in history, in, in the future, uh, uh, that they would refulfill the 70th week of Daniel, or that they would uproot these three kings. It's just beyond credibility in human terms. But this proves the thesis of one of the other characteristics of Antichrist, that he understands dark sentences. This is a reference to Satan himself. 
It is Satan that is the power of the Roman Catholic Church. It is the synagogue of Satan. It is the Church of Antichrist, the Church of the Counterfeit Christ. And if Satan be the head of it, then we know that Rome, with the help of Satan, can do these things in preparation for what Satan intends to do to deceive the people 2,000 years in the future. Satan is the great conspirator. Satan is the one who influences the hearts of his people, just like God influences the hearts of his people. Satan is a spirit. He's a false prophet. He denies the fulfillment of God's prophecy of the 70th week, and he seeks to counterfeit it, and he uses the Roman Catholic Church to do it. Now, do I say that the popes and the Roman Catholic Church knew Uh, 2,000 years ago, where they were headed? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Satan simply used them without their knowledge. But I believe the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church knows today. The end is so close that they can see it themselves. And they've simply followed the instruction of their God, Satan himself. And with, without their knowledge, they have, have literally fulfilled Satan's false prophecy. That's what makes it the Church of Satan, the Church of Antichrist. It legitimizes the Protestant Reformation, who protested that church because it was headed by Satan, because it was headed by his vicar, the, the, the papacy. And they came out of the church. They came out of the Roman Catholic Church. And up until Rome was successful in promoting the belief in futurism in the Protestant churches, they believed that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus 2,000 years ago, and there was no future fulfillment of this. Not unless Satan wants to counterfeit what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. And all of this counterfeiting comes from the Roman Catholic Church. It's the Roman Catholic Church that wants to present the papacy as the vicar of Christ on earth or Christ hidden under a veil of flesh. He cannot credibly do that in the world unless he can do it on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. But first, he has to have a nation state of Israel. He has to have Jews living in the land. He has to, the, the Jews have to begin animal sacrifices again after signing a seven year quote unquote peace treaty with the Antichrist so that the Antichrist, this phony Antichrist, remembering that it's been the papacy all throughout history that's the Antichrist, this phony Antichrist has to write this seven-year peace treaty. And in the midst of that, in the midst of that week, that week of years, seven years, he causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease. At that point, the whole world will be convinced, irretrievably convinced, that this is the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of the Bible. He caused the sacrifices to cease. And you won't be able to convince them otherwise. But it was Jesus who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Three and a half years after his anointing in the River Jordan by, the, by, by John the Baptist, three and a half years later, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his own life on the cross becoming the Lamb of God, the Messiah of not only Israel, but the Gentiles too. And they looked for a future one where the sacrifices and oblations will cease. Is this starting to make sense to people? The whole world believes this lie. I believed it for 50 years of my life. And we must come out of this great delusion to say that the 70th week of Daniel, which was the literal ministry of Christ, the Messiah on the earth, to believe that that seven-year period of time is yet future is to deny the Messiah has come. To deny that Jesus has come in the flesh and has been replaced by 
the papacy. The greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. And it is believed by the vast majority of those who call themselves Christians today. It has become the orthodox teaching of the Christian churches today that Antichrist is yet future. The greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. We have to remember the 70th week of Daniel is over. The vision and the prophecy have been rolled up and sealed. No man, even if he's the Pope of Rome, can break that seal and open that vision and that prophecy and do it over again to deceive the whole world. Come out of that deception. Futurism is a lie. Back to you, Yerk. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, I really have to say I hate it when you stop talking because it is so enlightening. I could listen to you for hours, and uh, it, ne it never gets boring. But um, still, we have to go on. I don't know, has Walt anything uh, to add here? Walt, you want to say something? No, not at this time. Oh, you're even speechless as I am, then, I assume. Okay, then I will go on continuing reading characteristics number two of the Antichrist, which is that Antichrist is to receive its seat and authority from Rome. We start with a quote from Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, quote, And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? End quote. Who is this dragon in prophecy? According to Revelation 12, verse 9, it is Satan. And I will just read this to you. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And as we know, Satan never stands before man in his true form. Well, this is something that Tom just said. He's a spirit, and he has to use men and his spirits possess man to get his will done. He is not allowed this option. In 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 13, this explains why. So when you give me a second, I will just go there and uh, read that also to you. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Just a second. I have to scroll down here. First Corinthians 10, 13, and that states, quote, There has no temptation taken you, but such as is coming to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to tempt it above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So, that explains absolutely why. So he must possess men to do his will. At this time, the dragon was attacking the Christian faith. It was Rome who chose to administer its hatred. This is not something anyone needs convince, convincing of. It's an open fact of historic record. Fact is, even the gospel portrays this definition of the true identity of the dragon at this time as well. You see, um, it was a Roman official who seeks to kill baby Jesus, causing the death of many baby boys. It was a Roman governor who condemns Jesus to die. It was a Roman soldier who whips Jesus. It was a Roman band of soldiers that beat and mocked Jesus. It was a Roman executioner that crucifies Jesus. It was a Roman official sealing the tomb of Jesus. A Roman squad of soldiers keep watch on the tomb of Jesus. A Roman governor places all followers of Jesus in peril. A Roman Colosseum is where Christians were fed to lions. And the points go on and on and on. Rome most assuredly allowed the dragon's will to be enacted back <clears throat> then just as it does today. Rome is all the dragon can hope to become. 
Paint in Rome is his masterpiece. Looking at the popes of today, as well as times past, one can see absolute Roman rule runs through the veins of this hierarchy. The clothing, the architecture, the laws, the belief structure, the art, the lifestyles, the lifestyles. Think of pedophilia and sodomy, the pharmaceutical religiosity, the political savvy, the global reach, all of the truths this prophecy fulfilled in Roman Catholicism. In fact, Pope Pius IX couldn't have been more accurate when he said that his discourse, page 253, he said, listen very carefully, quote, the Caesar who now addresses you and to whom alone are obedience and fidelity to, end quote. This has to be the only thing I like about the leaders of Roman Catholicism. They are so blinded by their hatred of the truth, as in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 and 11, we can read that later if you want to, that they actually make statements they have no idea allows the remnant Christians a way to expose them in such an exacting manner. They truly have no clue when they expose themselves as Antichrist by admitting to doing those things prophecy proclaims Antichrist will do. For that, I am forever appreciative. For I have seen many come out of Rome by merely showing them a prophecy and then showing them a statement made by their own leaders. From the Latin Church in the Middle Ages, 1915, page 6, we read, Speaking of the time, about 500 AD, when the Roman Empire was crumbling to pieces, quote, No, the Catholic Church will not descend into the tomb. It will survive the empire. At length, a second empire will arise. And of this empire, the Pope will be the master. More than this, he will be the master of Europe. He will dictate his orders to kings who will obey them. End quote. This statement, penned in 1915, was boldly excellent of the desires of evil men. For the author stated, quote, He will be the master of Europe, end quote. And today, this is an open and obvious fact. Soon this empire of Rome will spread all throughout the world. Need any more proof? The Pope declares himself Caesar, and then declares obedience and fidelity are due him and him alone? This is Caesar's heart incarnate. For the Caesars of Rome truly believe they were gods on earth. And today this is the case with the popes of Rome. I will prove that in graphic detail later. Another blunt fact is Emperor Justinian gave the keys of Rome to the Pope when he decreed that a Pope should rule over all the Christian churches of the earth in AD 538, as well as the people of the world. Daniel's vision and Revelation's woman on the beast was born that day. Who is the Virginius? Was he even a Christian? Well, this is a lengthy quote now taken from generalized information taken from Hope Beyond 2000 video series Rise of the Little Horn Daniel 7 from Kenneth Cox. I will quote this little article now. As the ten kingdoms of Rome were falling apart, there was an Emperor Justinian who was worried about his crumbling empire. He has a General Belsarius under his thumb, who he devises a plan during the wars that resulted in the unrest of Rome's fall. They decided that if they can get into the city of Rome, they will banish the Bishop of Rome so as to allow for a takeover that would allow the new system of Roman Catholicism to be set up. I'm going to stop right here. We will go into that uh, more deeply later, what I'm adding now. But what I've just read, I think everybody has heard of a Trojan horse, right? So while I'm reading this, get that little story back in your head and just transfer it from Troja, from, from Troy, to Rome. Continue reading. They needed this system because they felt they had no more political power to control the people. So they devised a plan that would give them 
religious as well as political strengths. One fateful day, while Belisarius is fighting, the Bishop of Rome proclaims that he will not allow any fighting within his city. This bishop loves his people and proceeds to close the gates and refuses to have anything to do with the war just outside the city. The fighting on this day is particularly strenuous, however. The Goths have pushed back Belisarius and his fighters all the way to the walls of what was left of the city of Rome. It looked hopeless. It looked as if Belisarius was going to be wiped out completely. So Belisarius scurried off the notes to his superior Justinian, saying, Save us! Justinian's wife is a Christian who happens to be a friend of the Bishop of Rome. Justinian pleads with his wife to ask the Bishop of Rome to open the gates of the city so that Belisarius and his men can enter inside, so as not to be wiped out by the Goths. Out of respect for her bishop, Salvarius of Rome opens the gates of the city to allow Belisarius and his army into the city to spare their lives. Justinian and Belisarius, however, had already agreed that once inside the city, they would banish the bishop of Rome. So once inside, they did indeed follow through on their plans. They banished the bishop and put their own man, Vigilus, who was not a Christian, on the seat of bishop and proclaimed him pope that very day. And there you have it. Just as this prophecy of Revelation chapter 13 verse 4 predicted, in the year 538 AD, the official beginning of the Roman Catholic Church and state conglomeration prophetically began. In 538 AD, this is another quote from E.G. McKenzie from the Catholic Church, page 14, the year when the Ostrogoths collapsed, it was out of the smoke and ruins of the Western Roman Empire and after the overthrow of the three Aryan kingdoms that the Pope of Rome emerged as the most important single individual in the West, the head of a closely organized church with a carefully defined creed and with vast potential for political influence. Dozens of writers have pointed out that the real survivor of the ancient Roman Empire was the Church of Rome. End quote. And this also ends characteristic number two of the 26 characteristics of Antichrist. I think this was a very interesting part and a very, very interesting read. Also, because you see here why the fourth kingdom prophesied by Daniel would be diverse of all the other kingdoms. And what was that diversity? It was that the political power was combined with spiritual power. The merging of church and state. What does the American Constitution say of that? And a few other thoughts. Now, please, elaborate it by Brother Tom Fress. Well, I believe the United States in Bible prophecy is found in Revelation chapter 13. It has two horns like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. In other words, its appearance contradicts its actions and its speech. The two horns, the lamb-like horns, are church and state, but they're separated. They look Christ-like. In our, in our Constitution, uh, the separation of church and state is clearly defined. The separation of church and state is clearly defined. The, ch- the state shall not establish a religion, and the two shall never mix. Okay? This is in stark contrast to the Roman power, the fourth and final beast on the earth that, that, that is diverse from all the others before it. Because in the Roman Empire, there was a hermetic union between church and state. 
The church ruled supreme. The popes ruled supreme over the governments of the world. They literally imposed and implemented and maintained Roman Catholic canon law to tyrannize the people. And because of that tyranny, the, 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 Protestant, uh, the Protestant influence during the founding of this country made sure that that old world order system could never again be reestablished, at least not in this country. They separated church and state. Never again would the Pope dictate over the government of this country. Now, pictorially representing the old world order, the union of church and state, pictorially representing that union, we find Revelation chapter 17 that shows the woman, the woman or the whore of Revelation chapter 17, representing the Roman Catholic Church, sitting atop and controlling the scarlet-colored beast, the beast being the government. There you have pictorially represented in Revelation chapter 17 the woman riding the beast, a church-state union. Revelation chapter 13 describes another beast that rises up in the wilderness that has two horns like a lamb. In other words, it looks Christian, but it speaks like a dragon, like Satan. And it says that it will cause the whole world to worship the first beast, the woman riding the scarlet-colored beast. And now, if you understand what I've said, those who are listening to this program and understand what I've said, then the next time you turn on Fox News or CNN or any other mass media outlet and you see Roman Catholic priests and bishops and archbishops and cardinals and popes hobnobbing with the political leaders of this country, it ought to make the hair stand on the back of your neck. And for the first time in this country's history, this lamb-like beast is going to speak like a dragon after it invites the Antichrist of the Bible, the Roman Catholic Pope, to come to this country and speak to a joint, <clears throat> a joint session of Congress. You'll find that this is not a Christian nation. It is an Antichrist nation making its bed with the whore of Rome. Everyone can see we've lost our, our Protestant liberties, those embodied in the Bill of Rights. We're losing our liberties. We're losing our freedom of speech. We're losing our, our, our freedom of conscience and our freedom of religion. They're forcing us through the ecumenical movement and through the the laws that are passed by this country, like the NDAA and the Patriot Act, they are stripping us of our Protestant rights, and they're forcing us by law, without our knowledge, to become Roman Catholic and be subservient to the Antichrist of the Bible. And none of it would be possible if they had not already previously sold us a bill of goods called Protest or, or called Futurism that the Protestant reformers were wrong, that the Pope really is not the Antichrist of the Bible, but that the Antichrist is future, a single individual that signs a peace treaty with the Jews of the modern nation state of Israel. You can't make this stuff up. It's being fulfilled right before our very eyes. For the first time in American history, the Pope of Rome and a Jesuit to boot is going to have a full attention of both houses of Congress. And not to mention, they already occupy seven of the nine seats of, this, of the Supreme Court. That's right. Seven of the nine seats of the Supreme Court are occupied by Roman Catholics. Only two seats remaining are occupied by Jews. 
And for the first time in American history, there's not one single Protestant on that court. Now, what is the responsibility of, of the Supreme Court? To interpret the Constitution. And what does the Pope say? I have the power to dispense with all civil law. That's who they represent. That's who those Roman Catholic justices represent. Their pontiff, not the people of this country. And that's why we are losing our Protestant rights. This lamb-like beast with two horns like a lamb is speaking like a dragon. And it is causing not only the people in this country, but the people around the world to her military force are forcing other nations of the world to kowtow to the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist, the papacy. The Protestant reformers were absolutely correct. And until we restore Protestantism in this country, Roman tyranny will be the rule of the day. We're going to have a union of church and state in this country. The church, that is the papacy, is going to dictate what the state does. She already does. That's why we're losing our Protestant rights. And none of it, again, none of it would be possible had they not destroyed Protestantism, the protest against the papacy, the protest against the Antichrist, and sold us a bill of goods called futurism, detaching the 70th week of Daniel that was fulfilled by Jesus 2,000 years ago, putting it on the end of time, and calling that Antichrist a single individual, thereby exonerating the whole history of the papacy. That's the only reason. Had this country never believed in futurism, had it maintained its Protestant belief that the papacy, and only the papacy, could ever be the, the Antichrist of the Bible, ecumenism would never have been possible. The Pope speaking to a joint session of Congress in this country would never have been possible. A Pope setting his physical foot on the shores of this country would never be possible. The Pope dictating over Roman Catholic politicians what laws to pass, what laws to not pass, would never be possible. This would be a lamb-like nation with, with, which would never speak like the dragon. Revelation chapter 13, the second beast described there is the United States of America. It fits. It's perfect. It fits like a glove. And it ought to make the hair stand on every American. It ought to make the hair stand on the back of your neck and get you down on your face and on your knees in sackcloth and ashes, repenting of futurism, repenting of, dis of, of renouncing your Protestant faith and accepting a futurist lie. The consequences of this error are unspeakable, incalculable. The blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus has only just begun in the United States of America because we have renounced our Christ 2,000 years ago and his fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel and believed in a future one. All of history can be wrapped up in understanding the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. And once you understand it, then all the lies become apparent. And who tells those lies? the popes of Rome, his Jesuit armies, his politicians in this country, the woman is riding the beast, and God's people are about to die. That's the hideous reality. Anybody stands up and refuses and resists this Antichrist power that is about to speak to our joint session of Congress is going to be summarily dispensed with with no more guilt, no more conscience than were all the saints throughout history and by the same persecutor, the popes of Rome. Back to you, Yerkin.
And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. I think there are no words, Tom, that can underline more what you've just said. We all that we are gathered here together by the will of God will live to see this year's September 24th, or whenever the Pope visit starts to America. And when we, he will address, as he stated, on behalf of the American people, the joint session of Congress. Now, we have already planned to do a special broadcast series on this Pope visits because we have given time to warn the people of this event because the agenda of the Pope was made official already some weeks ago. And um, the Speaker of the House, Boner, or how do you ever pronounce his name? I don't want to pronounce it wrong, but I have problems pronouncing it in the English way. In German, I would say Boner. Boner. He Boehner. says, Boehner, okay. He says that our holiness, the Holy Father, will come and speak at the joint session of the house. And all that are here right now, God providing we live still in September of this year, will have the possibility to see prophecy written 2,000 years ago turned into actual historic life event in September this year. Isn't that amazing, the times we are living in, when we understand prophecy? I don't have anything more to add to this right now, and I want to say that the last three of the first five points of the characteristics of Antichrist I will postpone to another day. Because Thomas. this broadcast this broadcast was so powerful, I don't want to exaggerate by going over two hours in this broadcast. But I surely will leave Tom and Walt with some closing remarks on this. And remind everybody who listens right now, live, download the broadcast, broadcast later, or watch the video that I will be making on my Jogger 66 channel to think about what you've just experienced here. Tom, you have some closing remarks? Yes, the fourth and final beast on the earth that Daniel prophesied about can only be the Roman Empire. The Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, and fourthly and finally, the Roman Empire. Then Christ returns. Has Christ returned? No. Then who rules the world? Rome. It can be nothing else, it can be no one else, or you're literally calling Daniel a liar. We, the whole world, is under Roman control. The kings of the earth now serve the Vatican, the Antichrist of the Bible, the papacy. It can be no other way, or you literally call Daniel a liar. There is no British Empire. There is no Japanese Empire. There is no Russian Empire. There is no American Empire. There can only be a Roman Empire. And if you want to know who controls the kings of the earth today, all you have to do is read the book of Daniel. Let me make it clear in your mind. The new world order is simply the old world order restored. And who is going to be extirpated and annihilated from that holy Roman Empire? those whom Rome has always destroyed, the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. And I'll leave you with one blessing. Blessings in the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. 
don't look for a future one or you will be deceived. Thanks, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. And uh, I want to remember everyone listening here not to forget the Roman Empire is just the continuation of the Babylonian Empire. It all goes back to Babylon. Walt, do you have some closing remarks? Uh, yes. Uh, I'd like to, uh, everybody that's on this call and whoever will listen to this in the archives, this message that is being broadcast here is uh, the only way it can be spread is by, by ourselves and the sharing with our email list. In other words, we're sharing this with brothers and sisters in Christ. The secular world is going to soak this up, hook, line, and sinker. This broadcast is focused on the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. And so all I ask is that you uh, send this link to this broadcast and the upcoming broadcast on your email list. And that's all I've got, uh, York. Okay. Thank you, Walt. There will be, of course, another broadcast of the characteristic of Antichrist because we still have to cover characteristic number three, four, and five. But I think this broadcast has taken it a little bit out of Tom, and considering his voice, I think it is better that we stop right here, and we will postpone the broadcast to a later date. Uh, thank you, Walt, for your participation, and uh, forget, uh, don't forget that we have to keep Michael in our prayers that everything in the hospital went well for him. Um, and um, I hope to speak to Michael soon again. And uh, hopefully he can join the broadcast on Thursday too, when we are talking about the Pope's visit to the United States of America. When officially for the first time we see that the land, the beast that was coming out of the earth, an unpopulated area of this, of this earth, starts for everyone to see and to hear, to speak like a dragon. If you have not understood it yet, you will surely understand it with our coming broadcasts, or at least in September of this year. With this, I want to end the call. Say thank you very much for everyone who attended the call right here. God bless you all, and thanks, as Tom said, to Jesus Christ who made this possible and in whose name we are doing this broadcast, because this is not for us, we do it for him. The gospel had to be preached to all the creatures of the world 2,000 years ago, and it still has to be done today, and we are just trying to do our shares. Thank you very much for listening in. See you all next time. God bless you. Bye-bye.